All right, so welcome everybody. Um, we'd love for you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and again, I'll just repeat myself a couple more times, but whenever you use the chat, please make sure you're addressing it to everyone instead of the default panelists. That way everyone can see your questions, your comments, um, and we can all learn uh, together about this awesome project we have. So the agenda for the next hour, uh, Dylan is gonna start us off with an icebreaker um, and then go into an overview of the Star Library Network, which is uh, the big initiative we work on at the Space Science Institute. I will then talk about the project partners overview for STEM Tales and then dive into the project with the description, um, the requirements, and all of the fun stuff involved with this project. Um, and we'll end off with application questions and the requirements to apply. Also forgot to introduce myself. My name is Claire Radcliffe Adams. I'm an education associate at the Space Science Institute. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the co-I for the STEM Tales project. Now I'll uh, pass it over to Dylan. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dylan Connolly. I'm an education specialist at NCILNSSI. My pronouns are he and they. Uh, and I'm gonna get you started with a little bit of an icebreaker today. All right, so I think where this project is all about telling cool stories uh, from across uh, STEM fields. So I thought, why don't I find out what y'all really like about science? What interests you? So I want everybody to maybe share in the chat, uh, what is your favorite or quick, uh, favorite quick STEM related uh, anecdote or factoid, like your go-to if you're trying to interest somebody and like, oh, hey, I know an interesting thing. Uh, so like for me, um, I am a big dinosaur fan, probably tell from my shirt. Uh, and so um, this, uh, one of my favorite things is, you know, despite how we see a lot of dinosaurs portrayed in popular media, like this piece of artwork right here, um, you know, you see dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex fighting a dinosaur like Stegosaurus, but uh, what's actually interesting is T-Rex actually lived closer to us um, uh, than it did to Stegosaurus. Uh, Stegosaurus lived about 90 million years uh, before T-Rex in the middle of the Jurassic period, and T-Rex lived at the end of the Cretaceous. So we're actually closer to T-Rex in time uh, than T-Rex was to Stegosaurus, which I think is pretty mind-blowing and uh, makes me really think about deep time and, and uh, how, how much time has really passed and how many different types of animals have lived on the planet Earth. So put in the chat, what is your favorite, um, and if you don't have like a quick science order, what's a favorite like story time book you maybe have used uh, uh, that's STEM related or just something that uh, you find interesting uh, that's science related. Uh, Sarah has put in the chat, pirates wore eye patches to allow one eye to remain dilated for seeing in the dark. They would switch the eye patch to cover their daylight eye when going below deck. I actually did not know that. That's really fascinating. So they use that as a way to keep themselves acclimated to, to different light schemes. That's actually really, really interesting. Octopuses have three hearts and blue blood. Yeah, Nancy, that's a really, really good one. Um, the blue blood comes, I believe, from high copper content uh, in their uh, in their blood, uh, so that when it's uh, exposed to oxygen, instead of our blood, which oxidizes red, the copper oxidizes as blue, um, which is a really, really awesome factoid. There's a uh, few different uh, types of animals that have high copper blood. There are 206 bones in the human body. I like that, Elizabeth. Uh, Marcia shared that water slows down light due to the surface tension, which causes image distortion. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really, really cool one. Uh, refraction through water. If you've ever done that bendy light experiment, it's really, really cool. Uh, Eva shared that fun fact, though, it, uh, it is genotype that determines the color of hen's eggs. You can look at a small patch near their ears to see the color egg they will lay. All egg and all eggs taste the same. I didn't know that about the hen's ears, that you could identify the color of their eggs based on coloration on the hen's body. That's really, really cool. <laughs> so said, if you eat lots of carrots, you turn orange. That's true. Too much beta carotene in your system can make your skin <laughs> appear orange. That is very, very true. I used that as a factoid to get out of eating carrots when I was a kid uh, at my mom. I told her I didn't want orange skin. Um, Lori really said, we sidewalk chalk the planets for our summer programs and amaze the kids with the sheer distances around town. Matter of fact, no, uh, you know what? That's a really cool activity. I'm glad you shared that. Um, Paula, most toilets flush in the key of E flat. That is phenomenal. Um, I'm so glad I did this icebreaker. These are, I'm stealing all of these. They're um, <laughs> David Scott said, favorite math things, 1 million seconds is 11 days, 1 billion seconds is 31 years, and doubling a penny every day for 30 days gets you $5,368,000 
$8,709.12. Marsha shared that there is more water in our atmosphere than in all rivers. I, that's amazing. Rebecca said that sturgeon can live up to be 100 years. That's very true. I don't know if I want them operating on me after uh, after the you know 70th year, but uh, we'll give them little little fish joke. Uh, Alicia, <laughs> to test that the Brooklyn Bridge was safe to travel, they had elephants walk across it. Y'all have some really cool ones. I was worried no one was gonna like have anything, but y'all have some of the best ones. Uh, Daniel Walsh said otters wrap their young in kelp to keep them from floating away while they get food. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, and Stacy Snyder said platypus sweat milk. That's true. They don't have uh, nipples, and so they actually just excrete um, their milk for their young directly out of their skin. So they just like extrude milk, uh, which sounds so disgusting and so cool. I love <laughs> monotremes. Uh, those were some amazing science factoids. I hope y'all have like maybe jotted some of these down uh, to use in your programming because those are some really really cool factoids. And I want I, I want to thank y'all for sharing those. That was so much fun, uh, and it really gave me a peek into all of y'all's brains and mind for minutia, which I really, really love. Um, well, thanks all for sharing that. Um, we'll move on. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about what StarNet is. Uh, so StarNet is a fantastic community uh, that uh, we host, uh, that uh, is a community of over 8,000 library professionals interested in STEAM activities, exhibitions, and kits for their patrons. We have a really great website, StarNetLibraries.org, where you can find information about all our current projects, uh, past projects, as well as um, have access uh, to things like the STEM Activity Clearinghouse, which we'll be talking about in a bit. Um, so with federal funding from NASA and NSF, we provide free training, exhibitions, kits, and, uh, and we're in the process now of providing solar viewing glasses for the annular total eclipse in 2023 uh, and the total solar eclipse in 2024. Uh, so if you haven't got, uh, heard about that we've, through our SEAL project, you can go to starnetlibraries.org to find out more and sign up to get some free eclipse glasses for you and your library system. Uh, we also have the STEM Activity Clearinghouse hosted through StarNet, which has over 500 library-specific vetted STEM activities uh, with uh, how-to guides, facilitation guides, um, shopping lists. Uh, some of them have how-to videos. Uh, really, really cool stuff there that are all designed specifically and selected to really be uh, deployed to do STEM programming at your library. Um, we also have the StarNet Community social media site uh, that we've set up recently. That's at community.starnetlibraries.org. Um, and that is, I'm call it, kind of calling it uh, informally, I call it our Facebook site, um, where we have uh, individual groups for all of the projects we're working on and some general interest STEM groups. And it's a really, really great way for librarians uh, and other informal educators, uh, as well as a NASA scientists to get together, share ideas, share projects, talk about stuff they're working on, and just generally talk about cool, exciting space and earth science stuff um, <clears throat> that you can find. So those are just some of the things that we make available through StarNet. And I highly encourage you all to, to check those out whenever you have the time. And I'll go ahead and pass this back over to Claire. Great, thank you, Dylan. Yeah, so that gives you an idea of who we are and what we do. And we'd love for you to join Star the StarNet community if you aren't already a part of that. Um, but next, I want to talk about the other project partners for STEM Tales. Um, so Twin Cities PBS, or TPT, is our project lead. So they're actually like the big um, overarching partner leading this great project. Um, and they are the award-winning, Emmy award-winning producer of the PBS children's STEM series, Psy Girls and Dragonfly TV. Um, so Psy Girls does all kinds of great activities meant for engaging girls and um, all youth in STEM with some really great gender inclusive strategies. Next, we have T2 Science and Math Education. Um, they are the creator of Storytime from Space. So some of you may be familiar with that, um, but that's basically working with the International Space Station um, to read storybooks about STEM concepts from space. Um, that's been wildly popular and they were part of this project as well. So they're really our lead um, of finding the STEM books that will be read, connecting with um, astronauts in the International Space Station. Um, but we will also be having storybooks read in other areas, such as the sea, the mountains, um, other places on Earth. Um, so they're really going to be leading the actual story uh, time. And then we have American University School of Education. So this is an NSF, that's the National Science Foundation funded project. So that means we do have a research component. So the um, American University will be studying um, an informal education 
And their main thing is they're going to be investigating the effect of media read alouds by diverse scientists and engineers and seeing how that does influence STEM and literacy learning in young children and on their interest in STEM careers. So they are gonna be really looking at how this project is truly affecting learners. So let's talk about STEM tales. So as I said with the research, um, the STEM tales big idea is investigating the effect of media read alouds by diverse scientists and engineers on STEM and literacy learning in young children and on their interest in STEM. So existing research underscores the positive impact of reading aloud in person to children. And I'm sure you all know how amazing and magical that is, uh, but far less is known about how media read alouds support children's STEM and literacy learning. In addition, research links strong literacy skills to future STEM success. So uh, starting young and having a strong sense and identity of STEM can really lead to getting a career in STEM fields. So the proposed research study of this project, again, led by American University, will explore the extent to which digital media read alouds can impact children's STEM learning. So what exactly is a media read aloud? Uh, you've probably seen that a lot throughout the project description, throughout the application. It's also in the FAQ, um, but for STEM tales, we are referring to videos um, that showcase educational content that can be shown directly to your patrons and included in your library programs. So this is something that um, you can just put on a projector on um, some, some sort of way to show the video in your programs. Um, so media read alouds are videos that, and in this case, we wanna show, show diverse STEM professionals reading picture books written by diverse authors and featuring diverse characters. So I'm just gonna show a little clip here. Um, this is from our pilot that uh, TPT, our uh, project lead, developed. And um, this will just give you a little bit of a taste of what we mean by a media read aloud. Oh. Hello, and welcome to the International Space Station. I'm astronaut Kate Rubens. And today, we're going to read a book about Rosie Revere, Engineer, by Andrea Beatty and illustrated by David Roberts. This is the story of Rosie Revere, who dreamed of becoming a great engineer in Lila Greer's classroom at Blue River Creek. Young Rosie sat shyly, not daring to speak. But when no one saw her, she peeked in the trash for treasures to add to her engineer's stash. And late, late at night, Rosie rolled up her sleeves and built in her hideaway under the eaves. Alone in her attic, the moon high above, dear Rosie made gadgets and gizmos she loved. And when she grew sleepy, she hid her machines far under the bed where they'd never be seen. When Rosie was young, she had not been so shy. She worked with her hair swooping over one eye and made fine inventions for uncles and aunts, a hot dog dispenser and helium pants. The uncle she loved most was zookeeper Fred. She made him a hat to keep snakes off his head from parts of a fan and some cheddar cheese spray, which. All right, so I'm not gonna show you the entire thing, um, but as you can see, it's showing um, STEM professionals in really thrilling places, reading books about real STEM professionals. Um, and uh, that is part of it. And now I'm going to also share that. So again, it will feature diverse STEM professionals as readers to underscore the maxim, if you can see it, you can be it. 
Um, the STEM picture books will highlight the skills it takes to be a STEM professional, and they will also be enriched with animation and live action of children doing STEM activities. So that was just the part of the STEM professional reading. Uh, but as you can see in this picture down here in the bottom corner, the episodes will be bookended with um, fun animation created by Sci Girls and PBS, um, just kind of bringing the kids into the story and setting the context for why we're going to be watching this episode. And then it will also feature, once the book is finished being read, real kids, it'll show uh, real footage of kids doing a STEM activity. Um, now, the STEM activity that they will be showcasing will then be able to be replicated in your library program. Um, so what we're envisioning for these library programs is first you show the episode, next you do a STEM activity, and then you end it with talking about the reader, the actual reader and their career and how they got to be there to really connect kids to real life STEM professionals. So who are we trying to reach through STEM Tales? Um, so we are looking to work with public libraries from these three regions, the Gulf Coast, the Great Lakes and the Northeast. Um, now I did put up the states that we're looking for. Um, so with the Gulf Coast, that includes Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. The Great Lakes region is Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And in the Northeast, we are looking at Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Um, we will be choosing 21 libraries, and we're really hoping to get a big, a good mix of all of these different regions. We're also looking for libraries from all communities. So that includes rural, small libraries, um, all the way up through big urban centers. Um, all of you are encouraged to apply. We're trying to get a good spread and a good mix. Um, all right, and we got a question in the chat. And yes, definitely at any point, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, so uh, the question was asked, with the media read aloud story times, are there interactive opportunities? So um, the, um, the hands-on STEM activity that will be included in your program, um, that will be an interactive part. And also we totally trust you all as library staff who, um, you know, you're excellent readers. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you know how to make story time really interactive. So you can definitely amend and adapt your program to what will suit your visitors the best. So if you wanna stop the program or stop the video and include some discussion um, or have additional hands-on activities that we don't provide, all of that is up to you and all of that is perfectly fine. Um, so in addition to who we're trying to reach, so those are the libraries in those three regions. We would like to see those libraries demonstrating that they serve children in pre-K through second grade. So this is a project really focused on the younger age group. So ages four to eight and their families. Um, so the programs will be designed to include both children and their parents and caregivers and families. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the materials you'll be receiving, but we really want the caregivers to be a part of this project and have a role in your programs. Um, we're also wanting to reach historically underrepresented groups um, in STEM fields. So that includes women, Hispanic or Latino, Latina, Latinx, however, whatever term your patrons identify with, Black and Indigenous communities. Um, and so the reason why this is important for us is the represent, representation of certain groups in STEM education and oc occupations differs from the representation in the U.S. population. So women, Hispanic, uh, our BIPOC community members um, have historically been excluded from opportunities that can get them into STEM fields. And while these groups are gradually increasing their share of STEM college degrees, they remain underrepresented among STEM degree recipients and STEM careers. So as part of the application, um, the first part does have a demographics section where you will use um, uh, information, uh, resources that are in the application to let us know who is in your community. Um, and, um, and, and in addition to that, we also wanna reach communities that demonstrate a need for resources to support learning. So this could include um, if you work in areas where your medium household income is low or education levels are low or 
uh, below high school graduation levels, that's information we would love to learn from you um, because those are the communities that we are trying to reach with this program. So libraries selected for the STEM Tales program will receive a bunch of different things, <laughs> um, starting with professional development. So we will be um, offering professional development to two staff per library. Um, and this includes two two hour long online workshops with two follow up webinars. So basically four virtual trainings. You will also be receiving a STEM Tales activity guide. Um, this activity guide will be aligned with the episodes that you will be watching, and it will have um, facilitation guides for how to do those activities. You will also be receiving a kit of activity materials for your in-person programming. So all of the activities in that guide, you will also be receiving a kit of the materials to do yourself uh, with your programs. Um, you'll also be receiving 10 different take-home kits to engage families in STEM exploration at home. Um, so part of this is we did write this uh, proposal back uh, uh, about a year and a half ago when it was still uncertain whether in-person programming um, was safe. And also we know that communities now are all different and some of you are going back full in-person and some of you are still doing take-home kits or virtual. Um, so those take-home kits can um, continue to engage families at home if that is what your library is more comfortable doing. You'll also be receiving programmatic support, such as flyers, social media, um, to help recruit families to come to your programs, and transportation reimbursement for families to get to and from the library so that we can eliminate barriers on participation. And finally, you'll be receiving a $1,600 stipend. Now, this can be used um, for staffing, uh, if you want to support your staff budget, if you want to have snacks at your programs, it's really whatever you want to use um, to really enrich the program. Um, and we have a question, would that be two staff per library location or per library system? Um, that would be two staff per library system. So the libraries that are selected for the STEM Tales project are required to participate in a front end evaluation. So this is just an online survey that will be sent out the fall of 2022. So as you probably know, we're in fall of 2022. So basically, as soon as we get our library selected in mid-November, you will be receiving um, an online survey uh, pretty much with your acceptance letter. Um, you are also required, so have two staff who will be running these programs, so you will decide, you know, who is going to be running these programs, maybe it's your, uh, yeah, your story time uh, staff, that would make sense. Uh, make sure you send them to these two hour long virtual professional development in the fall of 2023, so that uh, we're still in the process of developing all of the professional development, so you have a year to decide, you know, who is the best fit for this. Um, and then after that, we will have two follow-up webinars just for ongoing support. Um, and that's to, you know, just answer questions, see how you're feeling, if you feel comfortable with the materials. So the programs, we are requiring you to implement four of these programs. These can be an hour to two. We're just assuming, again, if in your library program, you know that four-year-olds, your, your younger pre-K programs, they only come for half an hour. That's okay. We're, we're, we're hoping that it can be between one to two hours, but again, we know that each library is different and the services you offer are different. So as long as you're implementing four programs, um, that is good for us. And that will take place in 2024. Now we do want at least 10 children and their parents and caregivers involved in that project or in that program. So just keep that in mind if you have the capacity to host a program um, with at least 10 children. Um, if not, this might not be the, the program for you. However, I will say all of the episodes that we're creating and all of the activities will be available for download on our STEM Activity Clearinghouse once they're complete. So if you don't get this project or you know, you're like, I just, we don't have the capacity to do a program with 10 kids, um, you can reach out to me. And in about a year, when we have all of the episodes developed, I can send those to you and you're still able to use those for free. 
Um, and finally, participate in a summative evaluation in 2024, and that'll be really similar to the front end evaluation. It'll just be an online or paper survey if that works better for you, um, just so we can see how the project went for your library. Um, can you purchase more kits? That is a great question. Yes, absolutely. So uh, in the STEM activity guide, um, it will have all the materials listed in the kits that you receive. Um, so if you want to use that $1,600 stipend to purchase more kits and purchase more materials, that is perfectly fine. And I do want to say it's a 10, um, actually, I'm not sure about this. I need to chat with our, uh, with TPT. I don't know if it's 10 separate, I believe it's 10 separate kits that you can give out instead of 10 of the same kit. Um, but I will double check that. All right, I also wanna talk about some optional things that you can choose to be a part of. So we are looking for five libraries to participate in a library advisory committee. Um, we would take probably one to two library staff per those five libraries to be a part of this committee. Um, but if you are a part of this committee, we, uh, we will help you to conduct focus group discussions um, with your parents and also give us feedback on the professional development materials that we're developing. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more later, but if you are going to participate in the library advisory committee, you will receive a $50 gift card. Um, and that is to the actual library staff who is a part of that committee. We're also looking for eight libraries to participate in a research study, and this would be for an extra $500 to your library. So if you are a part of the research study, it basically just means you will be okay with a, our project researcher coming and observing one of your programs and conducting interviews with participating families. Um, you will also do a pre and post survey before and after the program that is observed by the researcher. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our external evaluation of the project. So not listed in our project partners is Rockman et al, because they are ex our external evaluators. They just wanna see how the project is going. So they're not evaluating you, they're evaluating us and they're evaluating how the project is going at your library. So um, what they will be doing is just examining your, the professional development that we offer, the program implementation, and really seeking to understand how library staff engage children and parents around STEM topics and careers and how STEM tales can help them to do that. So um, this is optional, or sorry, this is these, uh, the formative and the summative evaluations are required for all libraries in this project to participate in. So as I said, fall of 2022, uh, basically as soon as you get onboarded onto the project, you'll be given an online survey to, um, all right, Dylan's head is in my way. Okay, <laughs> to get feedback on the pilot episode. So what I just showed you, I showed you a little glimpse of it. Um, we'll have you watch the entire thing and then just fill out an online survey about um, what you think about it. And then also to tell us a little bit more information about the communities you serve. Because as we start to develop new episodes, we wanna make sure that they are interesting to your patrons, um, that they are engaging, that you know the readers are reading in a way that's engaging. So it'll be feedback like that, that we'll be con collecting from that online survey. And then the next part is we would like your help to send a survey to a minimum of three parents and caregivers at your families. So this will be a really short survey, just again, to assess what their interest in STEM is. Um, and each family that participates will receive a $15 online gift card. Now you can send this to more than three if you want. You know, if you have 12 families that always show up at your story time and you know they could use uh, a $15 online gift card, um, the more the better. Um, but we would like a minimum of three parents and caregivers. Now the summative evaluation is at the very end of the project. So between the time of January and August 2024, you'll get another online survey and again distribute a survey to participating families. So families that have come to your programs um, for them to fill out really quickly. So um, and this online survey can also be a paper survey if you know that your your visitors 
would do better with a paper survey that maybe they just fill out at the end of your program. Um, we can work with you to make sure the survey is in a method that works for your visitors. All right, and great question. Thinking about patron privacy, um, details of what information is collected on the surveys. Thank you so much. Yeah, we will not be collecting any personal information, no addresses. They will be anonymous. Um, the information is really all about um, just if they, if their kids and themselves have a stronger connection to STEM or a greater interest in STEM careers. Um, but we will take, we won't be uh, taking any personal information. And our evaluation team is going through an IRB process um, to make sure that we are putting the privacy and protection of all involved in the research study at top priority. So great question. All right, so let's talk about the application itself. So it is due Monday, November 7th, and um, it is through a SurveyMonkey link. That link you can find in the link bank that Beatrice has been dropping in the chat. Um, the type of stuff that you will, the type of questions you'll be answering is first just basic library information, um, then we'll go into community demographic information. So you can use the US Census link that's in the application to look up specific demographic questions. Um, there's also a section where you can uh, say, you know, I answered your questions due to the census, but I know in my community, there are members that don't fill out the census um, for various reasons. So you have a section where you can explain um, more about what you know about your community, because we know that libraries in particular um, know the most about their communities. So um, we just want to get a feel for who you are serving at your library. Next um, is library capacity. So again, just remember the requirements for you. So being a part of the formative and summative evaluation and running those four programs with 10 kids and their families. Um, there's a couple questions there just for us to get a feel of if you have the capacity to do that, including how much staff or volunteers will be a part of it, um, your, uh, the type of technology that you have in your library so you can show the episodes. So that is about that section. Next, you will have three narrative questions. Um, these are just to gauge your commitment to um, having inclusive library programs, your interest in running STEM programs, um, and a little bit more about your library. So those are longer narrative questions for you to write out. And finally, we are requiring two supporting materials. So one is a letter of support. That could be from your administration. That could be from a community group. Um, but something to demonstrate to us that there is real interest in your library and your community to do this project. And the next is an example of a STEM program. So this could be a picture of a STEM program that you've run. This could be an outline of a program that you facilitated, um, but something just showing us that even if you're new to STEM, um, you have the, you demonstrate the desire to, to um, offer STEM programs to your community. Now, some of you have maybe already applied <laughs> and I've gotten a few emails, you know, I wanted to apply and I didn't know I had to have the letter of support. Um, can I get that to you later? Yes, absolutely. If you've already applied and you didn't put in those supporting materials, you have till November 7th to just email those to me and I will attach them to your application. Um, likewise, if any of the stuff we've talked about in the beginning of this webinar makes you think about changing an answer to anything, please just reach out to me and um, we can we can add those things to your application. Has the IRB been approved yet? Great question. I am not sure since I'm not on the research team or evaluation team, um, but Rochelle, I can look into that. And if you just send me an email, I will follow up with you on that. All right, so that is a little bit about what the application entails. Now, successful applicants, it's really these, these two main things we're looking for. Of course, have clear plans to reach groups historically underrepresented in STEM fields and commit to running four STEM tales programs with 10 pre-K through second grade children. And of course, it can be, you can have older kids, you can have younger kids in there, but that's really the age range where we're, we're shooting for, but we do understand at library programs, sometimes you get an older brother, sometimes you get um, 
a baby sister, you know, that's okay too. But the, the activities and the episodes will be designed for this age group and their families. We want this to be an interactive, um, uh, act, uh, interactive experience for a family to really engage over a STEM topic. All right, are we ineligible if we have not had a prior STEM event? Absolutely not. Um, so the wording in that narrative question is either describe um, some STEM activities that you have done or describe your interest and your community's interest in starting STEM programs. So as long as you can demonstrate that you have the desire to, to offer these programs to your communities um, and also maybe back it up with, hey, you know what, there's no, uh, for example, we're not near a science museum. People come to the library for educational programs and we wanna start doing science now. Anything like that is fine. We just wanna, um, you know, some sort of compelling, you know, this is something that we are interested in doing and this is something we have the capacity to do. A letter from the library board, perfect. That is absolutely sufficient for a letter of support. We'd love to see that. Now, can we take the library to the kids or are you wanting them to be held in the library? Um, we are really open to all of those, any type of program, um, as long as it can have 10 participants and their families. Um, if you are, if it's easier to reach your community members by doing outreach, you know, I know every library is so different. We're working with one small rural library on a different project where it's physically really hard to get to the library just because of all of the different railroads. Kids can't walk there. Um, those who don't have vehicles, it's hard to get there. So they do most of their pro programs in outreach. That is perfectly fine if that's the strategy that works best for you. Um, so outreach department programs can fit here. Yes, yes, that's fine. As long as those programs are serving um, your community members and you are hosting four with the episode, STEM activity and a discussion on that person's career. Um, outreach department is great. These are great questions. Thank you all so much. Um, and I can add these to our FAQ. The more questions we get, the more I'll add to the FAQ. So those who want to apply and want to learn more um, can hear the answers to your questions. All right. So it looks like we've got a we've got a couple of uh, questions in the uh, Q and A section. If we want to answer those, perfect. Yeah, that is really all of the the material I wanted to talk with you about. So the rest of the time is just Q and A. So um, Kat asks, are the take home kits something that can be circulated, or are they for one time use? Um, are they are being developed for one time use? However, if you want to, again, use that $1,600 stipend to recreate it and build a circulation kit, um, that is, that would be great. Um, but yeah, we are expecting these kits to not come back to you. They're just something that the families can take home and keep. Yes, you have full permission to reproduce all of the kits. Uh, Elizabeth just asked that in the chat. So uh, definitely, and if, if that is something you all, are interested in, we can do, um, we can kind of explain how to create them in one of those follow-up support webinars um, next year. Yeah, again, this is all NSF funded and it's coming through our nonprofit and TPT. So everything that we are creating, we want you to use again, we want you to share it. Um, so everything, yeah, free and downloadable for you. All right, another question. If we receive STEM funding from other sources as well, does that disqualify us? No, it does not. Um, we love any support you can get in the STEM fields is amazing. And that has, uh, that does not disqualify you or have any sort of conflict of interest with STEM tales. And can you talk more about the letter of support? What does it need to have in it? Yeah, let me actually just, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute and I'm just gonna look up that question. I will read it to you and we can talk through if you have any other questions about it. So give me one moment here. Um, also, someone asked if they could see a copy of the questions before they go into SurveyMonkey. 
um, because unfortunately with our SurveyMonkey account, there's no option to save it and return later. I'm happy to do that. Please reach out to me. I'm gonna put my email address in the chat. If you wanna see the questions and just think it over and talk about it with your team, that is perfectly fine. We want this to be as transparent as possible and as easy for you to fill out the application. The scoring rubric is also included in that link that Beatrice put in. So you can see exactly what we're looking for. So yeah, reach out to me at cratcliffe at spacescience.org and I will email you a copy of all of the questions before you go on to SurveyMonkey. Um, so let me go to the question about the letter of support. So it says provide a letter of support um, with detail with from, okay, so this is from your library administration with details on their commitment to this project and its alignment with the institution's priorities. Um, if you are applying on behalf of a small library and you're the only librarian or library staff, this letter can come from a library friends group or a city or town administrator, um, a library board. Um, but really this is just, it's a way to show us that your libraries, uh, that they know this is coming and that they support it and um, they're willing to, to do the work that the program requires. Will you email the recording? No worries, Cynthia. Yeah, so um, Beatrice just put in the chat, you can find the link to the recording in that link bank. So it's not gonna be up yet. It'll probably up, be up in about 24 hours, but you can return to it, share it with other libraries that you think might be interested, share it with your library administrators, um, but that recording will be available. And in the Q&A, uh, uh, Andrew asked, is a letter from the Library Board of Directors sufficient? Yes. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. All right, can you talk about timing? How far in advance would the staff have the video um, and review the activity? Um, we will try to get that to you as soon as possible. Let me actually look up, uh, the FAQ has a timeline. Let me pull that up really quickly. So um, we are still developing the episodes. They don't exist yet. We're actually still selecting the books. And we've selected the first one and we have selected an astronaut to read it on the International Space Station for a second round. Um, but we're still developing the activities that will go in that episode. So it is gonna take some time for us to develop those. Um, we are expecting the series to launch um, at the beginning, uh, actually at the, at, between late 2023 and 2024. Um, so the, I don't have an exact time yet, um, but we do understand that libraries are planners. We know that you plan out your programs months and months, sometimes a year, uh, half a year to a year in advance. Um, so that is our job at Starnet is to get uh, is to make sure that PBS knows that and has the materials ready in time for you to be able to um, run the programs. Um, additionally, we will be going through all of those activities um, and, and in addition to like culturally responsive facilitation strategies during those two, two hour long webinars that you, uh, your staff will be required to attend. If we partner with a local Montessori school or other organization, can the letter of support come from them? Um, we would love a letter of support from any of your partners. Um, we do wanna make sure though, again, that uh, your library administrator, and that could be you, <laughs> knows that this is something you're applying to. So, um, so I'll say yes, and also make sure there's something from your library administration saying, um, this is something we support. All right, do individual libraries apply for this or can a library system apply? A library system can apply. However, we want those 10, sorry, we want those four programs um, done with your, with your, um, with the 10 kids and their caregivers. We're hoping that many of those caregivers and kids can come back to those four. So if you do apply as a library system, um, you will, 
we will encourage you to choose one branch in your system to really focus this program at. However, again, all of the additional uh, materials you can distribute to your libraries once they are free and downloadable. Um, will this meeting be available to review later? Absolutely. Uh, Beatrice, if you could uh, drop that link fake in the chat one more time, there's a link there that will take you to the recording. Again, it won't be up for about 24 hours, um, but we'll get it up as soon as possible. Oh, I see you already heard it, Denise, thanks. Can several libraries partner? <clears throat> um, so we are, again, as I said, we are only selecting 21 libraries. Um, and so we will be giving that training to 42 library staff. And we're trying to get a kind of an even spread amongst those three regions. So, um, so I guess I might be misunderstanding your question, Laurie, but um, if you want to apply and you get your library program all trained and you have the materials, you're certainly welcome again to share that materials um, with other libraries, but uh, it might be tricky. We might not be able to, for example, select um, multiple libraries from one area. I don't know if I'm answering that correctly, but uh, shoot me a follow-up email and we can discuss that. All right, can we do the four programs in two sessions each, one pre-K and one K through two <clears throat> to account for varying schedules? Um, yes, yeah, that's perfectly fine. I would, you know, uh, try to, we, we are hoping that some of the attendants from the first two sessions, you know, at least attend those two. So try to get repeat uh, families to return. I know that can be tricky to do, but yes, that's fine. If you, if that is what works for your library to break up those age groups, that's perfectly fine. Right. Well, you all asked some really great questions. Oh, more questions. Awesome. Can we do two different locations and two different groups for the four sessions, <clears throat> like school and housing development? Um, yes, just keep in mind that we are, the activities are meant for um, the kids and their caregivers to also be engaged. So if you have two, if you have places where, um, <clears throat> you can lead a program with families, then that that is totally fine at two different locations. <clears throat> I also want to say, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm talking a lot, virtual programs. Whew. So sorry, virtual programs are also okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, Dylan, will you read that next question? Uh, so are the videos and activity ideas available for purchase without participating in the program? I am loving what I'm hearing, but I'm not sure if the logistics of the research part will work. Woo, excuse me. Yes, um, all of the activities and videos, I'm so sorry, <clears throat> are available and you don't even have to purchase them. You'll just have to download them from our online STEM activity clearinghouse um, once they're developed. So that would be in about a year. <clears throat> hmm. Apologies for the coughing. I'm my one-year-old has just started daycare. And so we've been through a string of illnesses, and now it's just like the remnants. <clears throat> all right, well, thank you all so much. If you have more questions, please email me. I'm going to put my email in the chat one more time, C. Radcliffe 
at spacescience.org. I'm also happy to ever just set up a meeting if you want to have a quick call to talk through some of these things. Um, I'm always available for that. So um, we are looking forward to reading your applications. And thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us, y'all.